Stanford University. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about the social and political context in which energy policy is made in this country. You know that when President Obama was elected, one very important element of his promises to Americans was to pursue a change in the way energy is generated in this country, to put government financing and know-how behind a change in, uh, in the economy and in the generation methods that are used. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that happen yet uh, during his presidency. And so part of the question is why and what's been going on on the political side. And I'll tell you a story just to begin about my daughter, who's a, a sophomore here at Stanford, um, who is very interested in environmental science and interested in energy issues, and uh, went to a conference at which she heard an entrepreneur talking about energy development. And afterwards, she described to me this real epiphany she had at this moment of hearing this lecture because she thought the way science works is you go to a lab, you come up with great ideas. Uh, if they work, you publicize them. And then, of course, everybody implements them because they're great ideas. And what she learned was, no, it doesn't actually necessarily happen that way because it takes lots of people's political, economic, social will to implement innovations. So. Um, it's that context that we'll talk about today, and by the end of our discussion, I hope you'll have a sense of where we are at the moment and why we are where we are and where we may go in the future. So uh, let me also just apologize here. There's some kind of little glitch happening, so you get to watch a little piece of my desktop at all times uh, instead of seeing only the slides up here at the top. Oh, and also I want to thank, just uh, before we go any further, Bo McKinnis and Anna Viara right here, uh, who are really responsible for all the hard work behind all this. Um, I'm, I'm merely the messenger of their hard work. Um, so if you think about less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a desirable goal for the future, and you ask a natural scientist how would we go about producing that, they might draw a little causal model or a big causal model that describes a series of steps, causal influences that could lead to this outcome. But if you ask a social scientist to draw a model to describe that process, it'll look very different. And this, this is what it might look like if I drew it. Um, and so what it says here is that perhaps you can get less CO2 in the atmosphere by emitting less in the future, and perhaps by creating a giant vacuum cleaner that sucks out what's up there already. And you can think about social processes that might lead these to occur. In, in this part of the model is a focus on politicians' behavior and legislation. And in this part of the model is the general public, the American public in this case. And the argument here, the, the perspective, is one that says the public creates important inputs that can instigate this outcome. So what we're going to do is focus on what the public thinks and how it leads to perhaps what legislators do. So uh, uh, to give you a little context, I want to show you quickly some quotes from people who have observed public opinion in recent years. This first one from John Sturman in Science, as you know, the most prestigious publication in our uh, disciplines. In 2008, he said, the strong scientific consensus on the causes and risks of climate change stands in stark contrast to widespread confusion and complacency among the public. And so the assertion there is that the public doesn't care, therefore politicians aren't going to do anything, therefore we're not going to see a reduction in emissions in the future. That's Sturman. Here's another quote, set of headlines that appeared in October of 2009, um, all talking about the same new survey result in different ways. One headline said, fewer Americans believe in global warming. Another one said, Americans more confused about climate. Another one said, Concern about climate change waning. And lastly, the cute headlines, US belief in global warming is cooling. The, all of these headlines were about one survey question from one survey. In December 2010, in Bloomberg Business Week, this quote, the number of Americans who agree the Earth is warming because of man-made activity has been in free fall. Or, the Economist in February 2011, not too long ago, why don't Americans believe in global warming? So you can see very consistent characterizations of public views. And the suggestion that I'm making to you so far is if the public has actually turned away from this issue or does not embrace this as a real and threatening problem, then the forces on government to take action 
are reduced as a result. So any terrific developments technologically in the energy sector may thrive just fine, regardless of government. On the other hand, they might do less well if government's not willing to take steps to enhance their application. So my agenda to start with here is what does the public believe, in fact, and to show you something about what I think is the real evidence. And the evidence I'll tell you about comes from a series of national surveys, and this, I apologize, this says through 2010, but today I will unveil to you for the first time brand new data collected in 2011. Um, and so you'll get a, a kind of up-to-date um, update on this. In, in all of the surveys I'm going to tell you about, these are interviews with representative samples of Americans done by what's called random digit dialing. So we call randomly generated telephone numbers, people on landlines and using cell phones are reached by this method. Everybody, regardless of whether they have a listed telephone number or an unlisted number, are reached by this method with equal probabilities. And we have extensive interviewer training and supervision that we have crews of people who I've worked with for many years who do this type of interviewing. Um, and I will tell you, I lose sleep at night being sure that question wording is balanced and unbiased. And that is one of the foci of my own research um, in, in survey methodology more generally. Uh, importantly, these surveys are never described to people at the beginning as being about global warming. We, uh, you can imagine that if we did call up that way, people interested in the topic would stay on the phone. People not interested in the topic might hang up. And so we describe the survey as about public issues in general and then gradually transition our way into asking questions about climate. Um, it, it, I uh, don't want to have us spend time on Aren't the response rates for surveys terrible? Aren't surveys inaccurate? Aren't survey samples biased? That sort of thing. I mean, I'd love to do that during the question period, but I can reassure you. In fact, sitting here is Lin Chat Chang, who has just finished an amazing paper that will be out very soon, where she gathered up thousands of data points evaluating the accuracy of survey measurements as compared to other benchmarks of the same phenomenon. And she shows that overwhelmingly, even for cases in which you might be surprised at low response rates, the survey results are re remarkably accurate, uh, stunningly accurate, in fact. And so I, in that sense, this methodology is one where um, I think you'll, you'll, you can have some faith in it. It's a science. So today, what we're going to do is talk about, first of all, American public opinion on climate change between 1997 and 2011. We will look in particular at the issue of free fall. And then the real agenda for today, the real meat of our discussion, is about what happened in 2008 and 2010 in the presidential and congressional elections on this issue. That I think it's fair to say that right now, there is a very widespread belief in Washington that Americans no longer care about this issue. And certainly, taking what you might call a green position on it does nothing to gain votes. That, in fact, in facing the economic downturn that the country is dealing with at the moment, I think many candidates and their advisors believe saying we're going to spend money on climate change is exactly the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. That taking perhaps a, what you might call a not green position a skeptical position saying, well, even if it's happening, we don't know if it's, if it's caused by humans. And certainly, this is not the time to be handcuffing the economy in order to address something that might not even be a problem. That message is believed to be a promising one, one that might gain votes. And so for the first time, uh, we have been able to do a set of analyses that I'm going to show you using a variety of different methods to see whether that's true or not. If we have time, and I doubt we will, um, I have a couple of little bites of dessert for you at the end. One about the question of how much priority do Americans attach to this issue? And lastly, um, is there differential impact of exposure to mainstream news on this issue versus exposure to Fox News on this issue? And I'll tell you now there is a different impact. Um, not a surprise. OK, part one. Let's talk about a portrait of public opinion up until 2010, and then we'll talk about our latest data. To put this in some context, I'd like you just to see the fact that a count of news stories in American print news media outlets about climate change has a very interesting pattern. Between 2000 and 2005, there were you know, certainly plenty of stories, but a relatively flat rate up until a peak in 2007. 2007 was, in some sense, the, the watershed year for climate change in the American news media. There, you could not turn a corner without seeing uh, you know, the, the cover of Time magazine with a planet and fire. 
that, so it, it really was the moment for this issue, and it, you'll see how that plays out in the survey data. Over this time period, between 1997 when we did our first survey in this regard and the November 2010 survey, Americans feel like they learned about this issue. So this is a question that asks people, how much do you feel you know about global warming? And I'm showing you here the percentage of people who put themselves at the top two points on a rating scale, a lot or a moderate amount. That number was a little less than 50% back in the 1990s. It's now, uh, in, in up in, at the end of 2010, was in the high 60% range. Now you might say, oh come on, this is people saying they think they know more, but do they really know more? And the fact is, in, in fact, that we have in political science and survey research explored this question at some great length, where you ask people on a rating scale like this, how much do you know on an issue? And then you give them a quiz, where you can give them multiple choice questions, or you can ask them open-ended questions, and look at the relationship between their performance on that quiz and their self-rating. And it turns out, in general, the people who think they know a lot do know a lot as compared to the people who think they don't know much, um, who do less well on the quiz. So this, in fact, is a very efficient way at gauging not only people's confidence in their own knowledge, but also, in fact, the degree to which they do understand the facts of an issue. So now let's turn to this question. This is, in some sense, our centerpiece question that has, for a long time, asked about people's beliefs on the existence of this issue. You may have heard about the idea that the world's temperature may have been going up slowly over the past 100 years. What's your personal opinion on this? Do you think this has probably been happening, or do you think it probably has not been happening? Here are the results we've seen from this question. In 1997, when we first asked it, 79% of Americans said they thought it probably had been happening. This number was 75% in November of 2010, not significantly different from that 79%. Now let's just pause for a second. These are huge numbers. In American survey research, we rarely see Americans agreeing about anything at this rate. And yet on this issue, even before it was in the spotlight, a very, very large majority of Americans agreed. Now it is true, if you look here, that in this little region of 2006 and 2007, this number peaked there is a significant increase from 79 to 85, and there is a significant decrease from 85 to 75, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the key point I take away from this graph is gigantic numbers and no evidence of free fall. Okay? Here's another question. We asked people, how sure are you of your answer to that last question? How sure are you that the planet has been heating up or has not been heating up? And among the people who said it has been happening, the percent who put themselves at the top two points on this rating scale, extremely or very sure, was in the mid-40s back in 1997, and it remains essentially the same today at 45%. Yep, there was a little bump up there in our favorite little time period, but no real notable change. When we ask people if the Earth has been gradually warming over the last 100 years, has it been mainly caused by things people have done, mainly caused by natural processes, or caused about equally by things people have done and natural processes? You can see that as of 2006, the first time we asked this, fully 80%, 80% of Americans pointed the finger of responsibility at human action. That number is 75% today. That is statistically significantly lower than the 80. But again, these are huge numbers. When we ask people, if the Earth's temperature rises by five degrees Fahrenheit, 75 years from now, overall, do you think that would be a good thing, a bad thing, or neither good nor bad? 60% of people in 1997 said they thought it would be bad. That number is not significantly different at 56% in 2010. Now here you might say, hmm, this looks like a disconnect. Lots of natural scientists who study this issue would say five degrees in 75 years? That's not enough time to build all the air conditioners we would need. But I think, let's face it, this is maybe a disputable point, right? Predicting the future involves lots of hypotheticals. 
And so I think it's harder for us to say this is the right answer or the wrong answer on the basis of any science. And it may well be that for many people who say it's neither good nor bad or who say it's actually good, they're thinking of it in very broad social terms. That we've needed to have a shakeup in our energy economy for a long time, and here finally will be the pressure that will change the country. So it'll hurt. It's like surgery. Nobody wants surgery, but afterwards at least we'll be cured. Maybe. OK. An, a last question in the sequence. Should the federal government do more to deal with global warming than it is now, less than it is, or about what it's doing now? A little less than 50% in the 1990s said they wanted to see government do more. That number rose toward the end of the Bush administration to, to, to about 70%. And after President Obama was elected, that number fell to about 61%. Now, my best guess, although I have no evidence to show you along these lines, is that when President Obama was elected, having made it very clear that he did plan to take action on this issue, lots of Americans thought he was taking action on this issue. And so, OK, great, since we're doing more, then we don't need a lot more than that. Well, I'll take questions a little later. Um, so the uh, pattern here, I think, we, we may well see, eventually, a decline in this number. We haven't seen it yet. OK, so let's just pause for a quick second. What you've seen is results for the country as a whole going up to 2010. This is through the period in which those headlines appeared during the time period when people claimed there was a free fall, when according to these questions, we're not seeing that. We're seeing majorities or large majorities or huge majorities embracing what many natural scientists say is going on with climate. Now, um, I will tell you that a, a year and a half ago, I wrote uh, an essay in the New York Times about this. And as a result, Stanford said to me, oh, this is very nice. Maybe we should send you to Washington to meet with some legislators and tell them about your results. So I said, OK, happy to. So I got on a plane and flew to Washington <coughs> Excuse me, and met with <coughs> some congressional representatives, senators, their staffs, committee staffs. And I walked away horrified because it turned out I learned I was not doing what I thought I was doing. I thought my mission was to help put these legislators in touch with what the American public thought about this issue. So they very politely said, come right in, tell me about your research. And I described the findings. And they said, uh, OK, well, that's lovely. But we don't think that's what people think in blank, fill in the blank, my state, my congressional district, whatever it is. I said, really, uh, I'm fascinated because you know we haven't really seen uh, a reason to expect that it would be different in your state. And they said, well, you know, that, I, I said, I'd, I'd love to see the surveys that, that you've been doing in order to measure that. Oh, surveys. We don't do surveys. Uh, <laughs> oh, how, well, how do you know? Oh, it's from the phone calls and the emails and the letters and the screaming at the town hall meetings when I go back to the district. That's how I know what's happening in my district. Could that be a biased sample? Could that be leading to some misunderstanding? Maybe. But what I realized was, these legislators were doing, I think, exactly what many, if not most, Americans would want them to do. That is, they say, America's fine, but my constituents are in the third district in Ohio. I need to know what they think. And I, as a survey researcher who thought I was providing data of value, actually wasn't. That it was completely reasonable for them to expect the possibility of variation, and I had nothing to say about it. So I came home and decided, OK, we've got to have something to say about it. So thanks to hard, really hard work by Anna and Bo, we've come up with uh, something that I can now show you, which is looking at differences between regions in the country. And you can imagine at least two hypotheses about this. Oh, hello. Um, well, uh, nice to see familiar faces every so often. Um, w one being um, that maybe people in hotter parts of the country, south, you know, would be more upset about this issue. Another possibility is that people who live in states that are served by, you might think of as the kind of the old energy industries, so oil, coal, natural gas, maybe would be a little bit more uh, anti some of this stuff. So in, in looking at these issues, what we did was to concatenate together all of the survey data that we had collected over a period of many years. So any one survey with, say, a 1,000 respondents in it doesn't have enough people in New York to make a confident statement about New York. But when you put together many, many surveys with all the people in New York, you can get quite a large sample of New Yorkers and Californians and Virginians. And 
the reason we felt comfortable doing this is because of the graphs I just showed you, which is there's been almost no change in the distributions of these opinions in the US over the last 10, 15 years. So therefore, we felt comfortable stacking them up. And these are the kinds of results that we get. So first of all, we'll look at the existence question where we ask people, do you think the planet's been heating up gradually or not? The state with the largest percentage of people saying yes was 99%. The state with the smallest percentage of people saying yes was 69%. So let's just stop right there for a second. We couldn't find a single state in which a majority took what you might call a not green position on this issue. And let me show you the distributions of these folks. So first of all, North Carolina does not have an X because we don't like them. We have an X here because that's the only state in which we had too few interviews actually to generate a number. The 69% comes from Kansas. The darker the state, the larger the majority. Okay? So just look around there for a minute. It's certainly not the case that you've got more dark at the bottom of the map, right? So that, that hypothesis doesn't go so well. And I'll show you in a minute that <coughs> it, the percent of the economy that relies on traditional sources of energy also isn't a good predictor. And let me just show you one particularly dark state, Oklahoma. Anybody know why that's worth pointing out? Senator Inhofe, the most outspoken uh, not green senator on this issue is from Oklahoma. And, <laughs> okay, so that's one map. When we asked people about human causation, <clears throat> there was a state in which 99% of people pointed to humans causing warming. The smallest majority, for the smallest percent we could find was 64% on that issue. Uh, sorry, um, when we asked about whether government should do more, the largest percentage was 92%. We did actually find one state where a majority was not in favor of an increase, and that was Idaho at 43%. The next smallest was Missouri at 54%, and the majorities went up from there. Texas at 65% was the next one. So the point I'm hoping you're going to get from these pictures so far is, yes, there is absolutely variation. But the states that are dark on any one measure, notice Oklahoma is not particularly dark here. The states that are dark on any one measure are not necessarily the states that are dark on another measure. So it's not that there are some regions, some states that are particularly skeptical on this issue. And furthermore, there are some states where representatives have been outspoken on the skeptical side, and yet their public is not necessarily with them on that. Um, what I've done in this picture is to circle a series of states that have particularly high employment rates in the coal and oil industries, Wyoming, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana, uh, as well as West Virginia. And if you look at the colors of those states, it's not as if they're all light. It's not as if they're all skeptical. So this is the kind of message which I could now go back to Washington with and say, thank you very much. We actually have some answers for you um, based upon our analysis of these surveys. And yes, there is variation, but it doesn't look like there are any states that in which uh, folks endorse uh, the skeptical point of view. OK, so let's now talk about the decline between 2008 and 2009 that led to those headlines. But before I go ahead, let me just pause for a quick second uh, for quick questions, clarifications, other things. Do you have something still or no? OK, good. Energy producing states might, choose, might stand to actually make money if the price of energy is higher because of the tax, whereas a state like Indiana that is manufacturing intensive, uh, that could be more of a cost. Yeah, that would, wouldn't that be nice if Americans knew the sophisticated economic analysis you just suggested there? Uh, <laughs> uh, we have actually, Bo is the expert on this. She has looked at GDP in lots of ways, and we have not been able to find any powerful relationships between the economy and views on this issue. Who is the 99%? We'll Which state? Uh, uh, I don't know. 
Well, I guess that is newsworthy, isn't it? But I don't. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine any, yeah. any place having 99% of the people agreeing yeah. on anything. Right, that's true too. Yep, that's a, it's a remarkable issue. Okay, I'm going to just do one more question, and then we're going to go on, and we'll come back for more questions later. To clarify, you know, one of the sub axes you're trying to project onto had to do with oh, employment in the oil and gas industry. But even in those states, how big a percentage of the employment base is in that industry? Tiny. Yeah, so would you even expect that? Even if everybody who worked for the oil industry in that state got instructions in their pay stub saying, exactly. tell the survey that it's a bullshit thing, yeah. it probably wouldn't show up because right. the absolute numbers aren't there. Right, exactly. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. We'll come back for more questions later. Okay, let's talk briefly about the decline between 2009 and 2010. If you look at this picture that I showed you earlier, uh, excuse, I guess 2008 and 2009, you wouldn't necessarily... Um, see a huge decline, but I can help you see it. It's four percentage points between 2007 and 2008 and five percentage points from 2008 to 2009. That's the entire period of pseudo freefall during this era. This is the kind of change that we typically see when we see change in American public opinion. We don't see 30 percentage points drop in one year. America is just too inertial. People are not actually paying enough attention to any one issue and the flow of information on it for huge shifts to happen. So I believe this is real. This looks plausible. And a, a key factor to bear in mind when you think about this and you think about how that rumor of free fall could have been started is to think about the fact that question wording matters. So you want to look both at our question wording and the wording of others. And so I want to just digress for a second to talk about a survey done by the Pew Research Center, which is what instigated those headlines. So the Pew release describing their own survey said, there's been a sharp decline over the past year. Now you already know, we don't usually see sharp declines in the percentage of Americans who say there is solid evidence that global temperatures are rising and fewer also see global warming as a very serious problem. So sharp decline. NPR, when they summarized the survey result, said a new poll by the Pew Research Center for Other People in the Press shows a big jump in the number of people who doubt the reality, the cause and risks of global warming. Okay, so that sounds like free fall maybe. So this is the result that Pew reported 71% of people in 2008 and 57% of people in 2009 answering a particular question in a particular way as I'll show you in a second. That is a big drop in one year. That definitely merits a headline. But the question is what headline? So here's their question wording. From what you've read and heard, is there solid evidence that the average temperature on Earth has been getting warmer over the past few decades or not? So this is a nice question in the sense that it's balanced. It's, it's got an acknowledgment of the alternative point of view with the or not. And it's certainly talking about gradual change in Earth temperature. Um, the past few days, you know, decades is certainly when the hockey stick points to some notable increase, but it's not the 100 years that we focused on. So it's a bit of a different question. But the real focus here to me is that this question is asking about what people have read and heard, not what they personally believe. And it's asking about whether there is solid evidence. So imagine that you're a person who says, you know what, I don't really trust scientists very much. So if you ask me, is the Earth heating up, I don't really care much about what they've been finding. I know the answer because I'm a gardener. And when I go out in my garden every year, the tomatoes are blossoming sooner than they have in the past. And I've been doing this for 50 years, so I know. So is it possible then that there's a chunk of people who form this judgment about the existence of the problem, not on the basis of what they've been reading and hearing and seeing solid evidence in the news, but rather based on their own personal experience? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this is just a way of giving you a little bit of an introduction to this picture. And this is a little bit of a horrifying picture. What I've done is to grab a series of survey questions, not only from Stanford and from Pew, but from lots of other survey organizations, including Gallup and ABC and CNN and Fox, where if you stood back and squint and look at the survey question wording, you might say, well, that's a question asking people whether they think global warming is happening. And the results 
all in late 2009, early 2010, vary from a high of 79% to a low of 49%. So depending on which question you pick, you can portray either a huge majority of people supporting it or a little less than a majority supporting it. And the point is this. It's not that survey research is unreliable. It's not that these results are meaningless but the different questions worded different ways tap into different beliefs that people hold. So you can't, as a consumer, simply look at this picture, throw up your hands and say, what a mess. Let's go out to eat. That instead, what you need to do is take a close look at the question wordings that were asked and decide which of those you think are tapping the beliefs you're interested in. And I, I think my conclusion is you would look at some of these questions and say, hmm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. And others, you'd say, well, that makes sense, but I can see how this is different from this. Notice, of course, that the Gallup organization produced both the lowest number and the highest number. So it's not, and, and Fox News is right in the middle. So it's not the case that you can point to some organizations as having a political agenda. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think what happens is survey researchers, when climate change becomes an issue, sit at a desk and they say, okay, well, stem cells. Now we've got to ask some question about stem cell in the survey next week. What should we ask? Well, I read a bunch of news stories. I think I know really what the gist of this is. So they write a stem cell question. And then they get stuck with it. After they ask it, they've got to keep asking it because they want to track trends over time. That's exactly what I did. That's what others do. And so you can get trapped into questions that you regret, but you can't let go of them because then you'd have to give up your time series. So in this case, I want to suggest to you that you want to be a careful consumer. And as it turns out, I, I want to suggest to you that this is the explanation that from our analysis explains what happened in 2008 and 2009. As I told you, there are about 30% of Americans who don't trust scientists, and they judge the existence of climate change by what they can observe directly. As it turns out, you may know, 2008 was an unusually cool year. It was the coolest year since 2000 worldwide, and those folks knew it. The low trust people were actually aware of it. We asked questions in our survey, and they were aware that 2008 was unusually cool. That's what caused them to, in small numbers, move away from believing that climate change was real. At the time this result came out, I did something very stupid. I made a prediction of the future, which uh, I shouldn't do. But what I said is, if the Earth starts warming again, then these people will move back up again. And as you probably know, 2010 was tied for the warmest year on record worldwide. And as I'll show you in a second, maybe it wasn't so stupid. So let's look at 2010 to 2011 change, our newest survey. So one set of results comes from tracking we've been doing in Massachusetts. So part of my experience in Washington led me to realize that I better start trying to do some state and local surveys. So we uh, engaged in a partnership with a group called Mass Inc. that does surveys in Massachusetts. We did one, they did two. And uh, I'll show you these results comparing 2010 to 2011. If you think of this time period as one in which maybe free fall happened, it didn't in Massachusetts. So this is, again, the question about do you think the planet's been heating up gradually? 84% of folks in Massachusetts in 2010 said so. 82% said so uh, a couple of months ago when we did this survey. When we asked about certainty among the people who thought the planet had been heating up, there actually is a notable and significant increase from 50% to 63% of people putting themselves at the top two points on this rating scale. Among people who thought, the this, this small minority of people who thought climate change had not been happening, their certainty did not change. About 35% of those groups placed themselves at the top two points on the rating scale. So notice that the, the believers, the green folks, are more certain than the skeptics, and the skeptics' certainty has not moved. When we ask people, how serious of a problem do you think climate change will be for the US if nothing is done to address it? Back in 2010, 82% of people put themselves at the top two points on the rating scale. That number is 76% as of 2011. When we ask people if nothing is done to address it, how serious of a problem will it be for the world? That number also did not change from 85% to 86%. Now, here's a focus on a little concept I'm going to talk about more in a moment. So I'm just going to ask you to be patient with me. And let me just say, the issue public, the people who are passionate about this issue in Massachusetts actually grew notably, significantly, from 15% to 22%. And we'll talk about why those little tiny numbers are actually potentially very important. Now, let me show you the newest survey results we have. This is comparing 
2010 to 2011 in national surveys. <coughs> so we leave Massachusetts, and we will see <coughs> a similar story with some interesting little quirks. So here, has the planet been heating up gradually? The, in 2010, 75% of Americans, as I showed you before, said so. That number increased significantly in the last year to 83%. So it's now, if you remember, the high point in the earlier graph was 85%. It's now essentially up at that level. When we ask people about certainty, there's a small increase in the certainty level of people who believe warming has been happening. But nationally, look at this. This is the skeptics. This is the people who think it's not been happening. Their certainty increased a lot, 35% up to 53% who placed themselves <coughs> at the top two points. Now, what could have possibly caused <coughs> that increase in certainty among skeptics from a year ago to a few weeks ago? I will propose to you that it is the Republican nomination campaign. That for the first time in a long time, a series of well-covered Republican candidates came out aggressively expressing skepticism on climate. So if you are a skeptic yourself and you're feeling kind of alone, like most people don't really agree with you, and then all of a sudden a group of people who are very credible future political leaders and present political leaders say they don't believe in this thing, that's a very sensible basis for certainty. In fact, lots of research in social psychology shows that an important basis for certainty is others who agree with you. That if you find out others disagree with you, your certainty goes down. If you find out lots of others agree with you, then you are less likely to, uh, to doubt your own opinion. Asking about whether human activity has been a cause, that number was 75% a year ago, 72% a couple of weeks ago. And here, the issue public holds essentially steady 14% in 2010 and 15% in 2011. OK, so we're now through the portrait of public opinion. So we can take a little breath. What have I shown you? Big majorities and no real sign of free fall at all. In fact, if anything, some upturns. OK, thought I saw a hand. Yeah. My question is about possible correlations with how people felt about the economy and how that, that would, might relate to how they felt about the Yeah, let's, let's hold extension questions till the end, if that's all right. And all right. so I just clarifications, if that's OK, and then we'll get back to that. Yeah. If you take some samples of, of your polling data and, and cross-compare them, how much discrepancy is there in the subsamples? Like what kind of subsamples are we talking about? Uh, you split each sample for each state in half. Like a random half? Yeah, random half. Oh, yeah. Random sampling works great. If you take any of these surveys and you, you split them in half, you get essentially the same result. And that's what random sampling is about, right? You could predict that. Uh, I think you're pointing, though, to, to what I find always to be uh, a very pleasant concern. You know, that there are some people who say, I mean, we could, we could go back here. Some people say, do the same survey twice, you're going to get completely different results. What have I shown you? Do the same survey nine times, you get the same result over and over again. So it's not exactly like that. Yep. Yes, this is exactly where we're going. Good, thank you for that. Perfect, perfect uh, transition. So let's do that. OK, so let me now give you a little lesson in voting before we uh, get into this literature. So political scientists for 60 years have been very interested in quantitative studies of voter decision making. And there are lots of things that we've learned. We've learned that, for example, some voters walk into the voting booth and they haven't actually decided who they're going to vote for. And this, they do what's called memory-based evaluation, where they say, OK, let me see what I can remember about these candidates, and then I will cast a vote accordingly. Most of us, however, do what's called on online updating. We know that there's an election coming, and we are watching the candidates over a long period of time, and we've got these little counters in mind. How much do we like Obama? How much do we like McCain? And each time we read or hear about some new piece of information, we update the counter. The more information we've got stored in the counter, the more inertia it has, so each additional piece of information has less and less impact. Um, that's a psychological process model. Uh, there's a, a set of research now uh, on what's called thin slice evaluations that shows that if I show you a very quick flash of two photographs of candidates competing for uh, a seat in the US Congress, and I ask you, who do you think won the race? You don't know who they are, 
this was a race run 20 years ago, you don't know where they are, that you will, on average as a group, you will identify the winner more than 70% of the time accurately, just based on that quick flash of the photograph. Okay, so what's going on there? Something interesting, maybe. We also know that in a more uh, substantive way, there are lots of different factors that influence any individual's vote choice. So people who are lifelong Democrats are inclined to vote for Democratic candidates, not surprisingly. People who think the incumbent is doing a bad job are more likely to vote against the incumbent. People who think the, the nation is in trouble economically are more likely to ask for a change in leadership. Uh, people who have interests in a particular social groups, so members of labor unions who think Democrats are going to look out for labor unions are inclined to vote for Democrats. Uh, people who think candidates are more knowledgeable, more trustworthy, more empathetic are more likely to vote for those candidates. Candidates who evoke positive emotions like pride uh, are more likely to gain votes. And candidates' policy positions also influence vote choice, but in a particular way. Um, that you might, sorry, you, jeez. So one historic argument made about what's called policy voting is that Americans don't know what they want government to do on policy issues, and they certainly don't use those preferences as a basis for vote choice. And so Phil Converse, in a particularly important 1964 paper, said, People don't have preferences. Candidates rarely stake out clear positions, and they often hug the middle. So the idea here is that candidates assume that the vast majority of voters are in the middle of some dimension. So there might be some people who think the military ought to be strengthened a great deal. There are some people who think the military ought to be eliminated. And then there's a continuum of others in the middle. Most people kind of like being in the middle of that dimension, keeping the status quo as it is. Therefore, all candidates should gravitate to that point. They should all try to express essentially the same moderate position. And as you can imagine, that would undermine voters' ability to choose between them if they seem identical. But in fact, I think there's a different way of viewing policy voting that Converse himself in 1964 proposed, in which he said, there, on any given issue, there's a small group of citizens who are passionate about that issue. And in fact, we have seen this to be true. So every morning in America, there's a little group of people who wake up and say, oh, another day, another opportunity to influence gun control legislation in Washington. <laughs> and another group of people who wake up and they say, oh, another day, another opportunity to address drunk driving laws. And there's a little group of people we proposed who wake up every morning and say, another day, another opportunity to influence government on climate change. This is the issue public. These are the citizens who are passionate on this issue. And uh, I won't take too much time to explain what it is that gets people into issue publics, but what a very large literature and growing literature has shown is that these people pay close attention to what candidates say on an issue. They infer candidate differences, even when they're not stated explicitly, and they vote based on the issue. OK. So uh, I don't need to show you that model. Um, but when it comes to climate change, we wanted to see, does this logic hold? So first of all, let me show you that there's been a doubling of the climate change issue public since 1997. It was 8% in the first survey that we did. It's 15% as of this new survey a couple of weeks ago in 2011. That's more than 38 million people who are ready to write a letter, write a check, make a phone call, cast a vote based on this issue, according to this theory. Now, just to show you how does this fit, at 15%, this issue public is smaller than some issue publics in recent years. Abortion when in the 1990s produced the, the largest we ever saw at 31%. Uh, but some issues like capital punishment and women's rights and race relations and unemployment attract smaller groups of people. So you might imagine if you ask people right now, how important is the issue of unemployment to you personally? It would attract a huge number of Americans, but it doesn't. There's a, a small group of people who are really passionate about that issue. Now, here's the thing. When you look at these issue publics across these various issues, what we see over and over again is about 50-50 split in any group. There are the liberal and the conservative folks on that issue. And so, for example, on gun control, no matter what government does, about half of the passionate people are going to be happy, and about half of the passionate people are going to be unhappy. But climate change is really weird. It's the only issue on which we have seen an exception to this pattern. And this is what it looks like. That in 2006, and 7, and 8, and 9, and 10, we see gigantic majorities of the issue public 
on the green side of this issue. The passionate people are overwhelmingly on that side. So what that means is, this is a very different issue potentially when it comes to voting. Because imagine that a candidate says, I'm for strict gun control laws. Well, about half of the people who are going to use this issue as a basis for their vote will be attracted to the candidate, while the other half will be repelled. But not in this case. In this case, the overwhelming majority of people who are prepared to vote based on the issue are looking for candidates to take green positions, according to this analysis so far. So the question is, did it actually happen? Did people actually cast votes in favor of green candidates and against green candidates because of what they said on these issues? So this is where amazing work by uh, Bo and Anna comes in. So we're going to look first at the 2010 congressional elections. And let me just show you a few little headlines that appeared very quickly after the election before anybody had any time to do any data analysis. Um, one said, Democrats who took risk and voted for climate bill pay price. or in contrast, cap and trade didn't kill the Dems, or it's not the climate bill, stupid, or by the way, this one came from Politico, ignoring evidence Politico spins climate vote as an electoral loser. So clearly, differences of opinion about what just happened in that election. So we wanted to find out what really happened. So step one for us was a gargantuan project where we grabbed all of the campaign and incumbent websites, sorry, it doesn't say here, uh, we, all of the campaign and incumbent websites uh, for all of the candidates running for positions in the U.S. House and Senate in 2010. This was 960-something, maybe? Uh, a lot of websites. And then what we did was an elaborate coding process to determine whether each candidate took a green position on climate, took a not green position on climate, or said nothing about climate. Now, you might ask, how many Americans actually read these websites? I don't know. But what I will tell you is that what we have found in analysis of campaign rhetoric is that candidates are remarkably similar in what they say across various settings. So what they say to news reporters and what they say in their stump speeches and what they say in debates and what they say on their websites correlates remarkably strongly. Not perfectly, but this is a reasonable way to make some inferences about who was where on these issues. So let me show you who said what, first of all, and then we'll relate this to election outcomes. So among the Democrats running for the Senate, 43% of them said nothing on climate, and 57% of them took a green position. Not one person took a not green position. Okay, so first, two, two lessons to take away from this. So clearly there were differences of opinion among these candidates about what was the best thing to do on the issue, and maybe they were right. But secondly, there's enough variation among the candidates so that we can actually do a statistical analysis and look at whether these true groups of people differed in their rates of electoral victory. Republicans running for the Senate, 83% of them said nothing on climate. 9% took a green position and 9% took a not green position. So clearly, Republicans thought best to say nothing. Among the Democrats running for the House, 40% said nothing. 60% took a green position. So again, we have enough variation here to be able to study it. 1% took a not green position. And among the Republicans, 78% said nothing. 6% took a green position and 16% took a not green position. So if we just stop here for a second, you know these candidates and or their advisors did not agree with the logic I have expressed to you so far, right? That if you follow the logic that I expressed and you endorse it, then you'd have your candidate out there expressing a green position. But lots and lots of candidates didn't do that. Maybe they were right. Maybe I was wrong. Let's find out. Did climate strategy correlate with victory rates? Okay, so we're just categorizing these races. So I'm going to walk you through this graph. And the first place I want you to look is, uh, oh no. All right, Fred, we'll start here. Um, so this is, the Democrats said nothing about climate and the Republicans said nothing about climate. 17% of the Democrats won their races. Democrats did very badly if they said nothing about climate. Now, let's compare this to the Republican remain silent, but the Democrat takes a green position. What happens to the Democrats? Kaboom! Their victory rate goes up to 69% in that case. So that's consistent with the idea, and let's not get carried away, we'll get careful in a second, that this change from being silent to taking a green position helped. Now, when we make this comparison, the Democrat being green and the Republican being silent, now the Republican takes a not green position in contrast. 
Okay? What happens? Nothing. It does not help the Republican to go not green. It doesn't hurt, but the Democrats are already doing awfully well. What happens if both candidates take a green position? So here we transition from the Democrat being green and the Republican being silent to now the Republican fights back with the same message. Boom, the effect is gone. It no longer helped the Democrat anymore. They're the same on this issue. And so the advantage for the Democrat is gone. When the Democrat is silent and the Republican is not green, there is actually a significant decline. So this is the one case in which we see evidence that it helps to be not green. And that is when you're a Republican and your Democratic opponent is silent. But if only, you know, the minute this happens, sorry, the minute this happens, the minute the Democrat says nothing, the Republican goes not green, this is the moment when the Democrat ought to jump into this column and make it go away. Okay? So that's the principal story here. And you, can, you might very well say, well, yeah, yeah, but aren't there lots of things that are confounded? I mean, how do we know that it really was climate position that was causing this? Maybe the incumbents were more willing to go green and they get elected at a higher rate. So this is a very complex analysis that controls for lots of things, like whether the Democrat was an incumbent or not, whether the Republican was an incumbent or not, how much of a margin of victory President Obama enjoyed in the 2008 election in that state or district. So the idea being that there are some places where the Democrat is, Democrats are always popular, and so that could be a confound. We're controlling for that. And the basic story, which I'm not going to walk you through, the, all these little asterisks tell you that the effects that I showed you earlier are all real, and they all remain apparent even when you control for these other potential confounds. But still, we don't know for sure what caused what. And this is the way social science operates. So now we use a new research method which complements this first method to get a stronger handle on causality. So here's how we did it. This is an experiment embedded in a survey. So we did a national random digit dial telephone survey, and all of the respondents were told about a hypothetical candidate running for the Senate from their state. They heard the candidate utter some quotes. The interviewer said, I'm going to read you now some things that the candidate said uh, and like your opinion about each of them. So <clears throat> they heard the candidate make statements on either two or three issues. And then we asked, how likely are you to vote for or against this candidate? Got the picture? So they hear the candidate say some things, and then they express likelihood of voting. So one third of the respondents are in what's called the control group. The control group heard quotes on just two issues, like let's say terrorism and the economy having nothing to do with climate change. And after they heard each of these quotes, they were asked, do you mostly agree or mostly disagree with what the candidate said on that issue? And then finally we asked them, how likely are they to vote for or against the candidate? Another one third of the respondents were in what we call the green group. They heard the same quotes on two irrelevant issues, plus they heard the candidate say this on climate change. And so if you'll forgive me, I want you to actually hear this. Here's what the candidate said. This is a green position. Like most Americans and most of the residents of our great state, I believe that global warming has been happening for the last 100 years, mainly because we've been burning fossil fuels and putting out greenhouse gases. Now is the time for us to stop this by ending our dependence on imported oil and coal to run our cars and heat our houses. We need to begin using new forms of energy that are made in America and will be renewable forever. We can build better cars that use less gasoline. We can build better appliances that use less electricity. And we can make power from the sun and from wind. We don't have to change our lifestyles, but we do need to reshape the way our country does business. We need to end our long-term addiction to polluting the environment and instead let American genius do what it does best, transform our outdated ways of generating energy into new ones that create jobs and entire industries and stop the damage we've been doing to the environment. Okay, now, where did this come from? This actually came from excerpts of quotes from politicians. And so you can find a, a lot of what President Obama said in campaigning in 2008 that looked like this. We didn't find any single candidate who said all of it. We put it all together. Now, the last one third are in what we call the not green group. And these folks heard instead the candidate make what we might call a skeptical statement on climate. And again, I want to read it to you. There isn't any real science to say we are changing the climate of the earth. The science on global warming is a hoax and is an attempt to perpetrate a fraud on the American people. Climate science is junk science, and global warming is a manufactured controversy. 
I don't buy the whole man caused global warming, man caused climate change mantra, and I believe that there's not sound science to back that up. We must spend no effort to deal with something that is not a problem at all. Yet that's exactly what's happening with the cap and trade bill that Congress has considered. I oppose the cap and trade bill. Cap and trade is a job killer and damages our economy. We should not invest in windmills and solar panels as alternative energy sources. Instead, we should continue to focus on our traditional sources of energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. We should expand energy production in our country, including by continuing to mine our coal and doing more drilling for oil here at home. Now again, there are lots of parts to this, but this is taken, importantly, from the websites of candidates who express this not green position. So what happens here? What we've done is we've experimentally manipulated whether the candidate is silent, green, or not green. And the question we want to ask is, did this affect re respondents' reported likelihood of voting for the candidates? And the answer is, it does. Among the control group, 65% said they would vote for the candidate. When instead the candidate was not silent, took a green position, that number went up to 77%, significant increase. And when the candidate expressed a not green position, that number dropped significantly to 48%. So those differences are about the magnitude that we would expect given the size of the issue public. Uh, now, I want to show you that when we break this down, you see an interesting pattern between Democratic voters, Republican voters, and independents. Because many people would say, well, the real people in play here are the independents. So among Democrats, you can see an even larger increase going from the control group to the green group from 53% to 74%, and an even larger drop from 53 to 37 in the not green group. When we look at Republicans, actually there's essentially no impact of any of this. So moving from the control group to the green group, there's no increase. There is actually a significant but small decrease moving from the control group to the not green group. But the real question is the independents, right? If those are the people in play, those are the candidates' targets, how did these messages influence them? Well, the answer is just like the Democrats. <coughs> so <clears throat> as compared to the control group, the green group showed a significant increase in the percent of people saying they would vote for the candidate, and an even bigger decrease when the candidate went, went not green. Um, I'll show you just very quickly that among the people who told us they were passionate about this issue, you can see sizable increases and decreases. These are the issue public members. And among people who did not care about the issue, the differences are much smaller, just as we would expect. Okay. Uh, we also did this very same experiment in three states, in Florida, Maine, and Massachusetts, and got exactly the same results. Now, the last bit of evidence I want to share with you has to do with the 2008 presidential election. But before we do, again, let's take a little breath. What did I just show you? Well, I showed you that in correlational analysis, candidate statements on climate during the 2010 congressional campaigns correlated powerfully with their electoral success, even controlling for lots of potentially confounding factors. And when we move into a survey experiment context where we control what this hypothetical candidate says, we see exactly the same kinds of results consistent with our expectations. Okay, so now, in the 2008 presidential election, you might think back and say, okay, I hear what you've told me so far, but isn't your logic going to suggest that there would be no impact of this issue at all? Because in fact, John McCain was co-author of a bill trying to limit greenhouse gas emissions. So in fact, there was no meaningful difference between the two candidates in their positions on climate. <coughs> and if you look <coughs> at their campaign websites, you could actually reinforce that conclusion. So here's John McCain's campaign website. As you can see, there's a little tab up here on issues. Uh, when you click on the issues tab, there is um, a uh, climate change link. And when you go to that, you see his policy on climate change, and he endorsed cap and trade as a particularly important strategy for reducing emissions. This looked like a green candidate. When you look at Barack Obama's website, he also had an issues link. When you look at the issues link, he had energy and the environment here. And when you look at that page, it was a long story that, uh, excuse me, that, that also talked about cap and trade. There's a lot of content in common there. Therefore, you might say, no difference between these guys. However, let's look at the October 7th, 2008 final 
debate between these two candidates when they were asked about their positions on climate change. So the question was, I want to know what, would, uh, what you would do within the first two years to make sure that Congress moves fast as far as environmental issues like climate change and green jobs. So here's what John McCain said. Look, we're in tough economic times. We all know that. And let's keep, never forget, the struggle that Americans are in today. But when we, can, when we have an issue that we may hand our children and our grandchildren a damaged planet, I have disagreed strongly with the Bush administration on this issue. I traveled all over the world looking at the effects of greenhouse gas emissions, Joe Lieberman and I, and I introduced the first legislation and we forced votes on it. That's the good news, my friends. The bad news is we lost. But we kept the debate going and we kept this issue to, to posing to Americans the danger that climate change opposes opposes. So does that sound like an articulate and compelling statement of I'm green on this issue, you elect me, I'll solve the problem? I tried, I really did. It just didn't work. Here's what Barack Obama said. It is absolutely critical that we understand this is not just a challenge, it's an opportunity. Because if we create a new energy economy, we can create 5 million new jobs easily here in the United States, and we can do it. But we're going to have to make an investment. The same way the computer was originally invented by a bunch of government scientists who were trying to figure out for defense purposes how to communicate, we've got to understand that this is a national security issue as well. And that's why we've got to make some investments, and I've called for investments in solar, wind, and geothermal. It's easy to talk about this stuff during a campaign, but it's important for us to understand that it requires a sustained effort from the next president. So that sounds a lot like that green statement I showed you before. Sorry. So now let me show you some analysis of whether this made a difference. So the argument I'm making here is that actually the candidates did appear to be different on climate. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm actually going to go very quickly through all. I'm not going to show you everything. I'm just going to show you this table right here, which has lots of numbers in it. And it's a very sophisticated analysis that we can tell you about afterwards if you like. Uh, but the key point is if you look across this top row, which I know you can't, at this column, and this column, and this column, you see three asterisks in every case. What that means is controlling for political ideology, party identification, approval of President Bush, perceptions of the national economy, and lots of other variables. Believing that you are closer to Barack Obama on the climate issue than John McCain led you to vote more often for Barack Obama instead of for John McCain. So this is a third method, a third set of results, a different survey and the same conclusion. Uh, and I will show you that among people who said they cared about the issue, the effect was substantial and significant. Among the people who did not care about the issue, the effect was completely invisible. So that's, again, consistent with the issue public hypothesis. So conclusions. America has been and remains largely green. Taking green positions has helped candidates. Taking not green positions has hurt candidates. And the impact is concentrated among the issue public. Whew. OK. So what have I shown you? I hope that during this little time we've spent together, you first of all have a sense for how social scientists do investigations like this, that we use methodologies like survey research and sophisticated statistical techniques that allow us to get in the heads of citizens and voters and to understand what it is that drives their opinions and when they use their opinions in particular ways. Secondly, I hope you've gotten a sense, maybe a bit better than you had an hour ago, of what Americans think, how those views have shifted, and why they have shifted over time. And most importantly for this new work, I hope you have a sense of why the evidence, at least for me, suggests that a lot of candidates in Washington have been both mischaracterizing the American public and have been misjudging the potential of their statements to help them win elections on this issue. So as you watch this next set of campaigns go on, the Republican candidates have already, many of them, made commitments to skeptical positions. The press is not going to let them out of that easily. So the interesting question is whether uh, the Republican candidates who have not said taken those positions uh, do better in the primaries in the long run, whether they would do better in the general election. Uh, and therefore, that some of these attempts at doing what traditionally happens during this part of the campaign season, that is, during primaries, candidates try to be more and more extreme. You want to be more of a real Republican than everybody else. The Democrats want to be more of a real Democrat than everybody else. And if being skeptical on climate appears to seem being true Republican, 
then expressing those positions now might help get somebody the nomination, but it might also undermine their ability to actually win the general election in 2012. So with that, let me thank you very much for your time and your attention, and we can do questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.